This is your news source evening bulletin for today, Friday, the 28th day of May in the year 2021. I'm Gordon Mosley. Here's what we're tracking tonight. The regional chairman of Region 10, Deron Adams, is pleading with the government to rush more aid and assistance into the flood-ravaged Kukwani area, where in some parts of that community, flood waters have reached 8 feet high. The regional chairman told news source this afternoon that the situation is devastating for many residents who have seen their farms and homes on the water. At the disaster we are currently experiencing and the images that you would have seen in Kokwani has affected residents, it has affected property, agriculture, business, everything. It has negatively impacted the economic, social and physical well-being of our people. Um, in Kokwani right now, water is high as eight feet. Um, uh, and Arima, we are experiencing the same thing. Um, I'm concerned about the health of the people there. At Morataro and Malali, we are experiencing the same. The chairman explained that a number of other Region 10 communities are also flooded. He spoke to the president and cabinet members today and briefed them on the flood situation in his region. Adams wants to see a comprehensive plan to get relief to the affected residents and communities. So we need at this point one to ensure that we first have a full functional flood health preparedness and response plan at this time. I would have mentioned that to the government that we need a national flood relief task force immediately. Um, we are seeing, we have seen what is happening in uh, other areas out here at Mackenzie as well. And the government has also been asked to provide more support to the regional authorities as they try to alleviate the impact being felt by the residents. The flooding is being blamed on heavy rainfall which saw creeks and rivers overflowing their banks in the region, coupled with poor maintenance of drainage facilities in some areas. I know for, for Kokwani it has to be it's high tide along with um, the rainfall. Um, in communities across Mackenzie and Wisma, poor drainage. We would have submitted um, work recommendations for work to be done in a number of communities for drainage to be uh, clogged drains to be clean, for infrastructure works um, to be done in those areas. And um, I think that is what is, is, is primarily. Um, been the force behind what we're experiencing um, and so we're calling for an increase in allocation for those dilapidated infrastructures here in the region you would have seen the, the what the rain would have done to the road to kokwani now we want to get in there to deliver food hampers and so on but of course that will likely be an hindrance to us traveling by road into kokwani from linden has been affected as some sections of the main road have washed away and flood waters remain steady the civil defense commission continues to monitor the flood hit communities and has started moves to get relief supplies in nine of Guyana's 10 administrative regions are currently dealing with flooding in some of their communities more news coming up in just a moment Diana. But as a people, we have weathered every storm and risen to every challenge because it is the people of Guyana that gives it its strength. All the people, regardless of race, class or religion, we, we are, are one people, people, one strength. And now is our time, a time to rise. Together, we rise. I took the vaccine. My name is Gordon Mosley and I took the vaccine on Friday and I'm encouraging you, if you've made the choice, go take the vaccine. Protect yourself against COVID-19. COVID-19 is no joke. I've been covering the story from day one and it scares me and it should scare you too. So there are vaccination sites all around. Go to the Ministry of Health Facebook page, follow the information, keep your mask on and go take the vaccine. You'll be happy you did. Mobile One is more than oil, it's many oils. It transforms at the molecular level. When cold, it's thicker than honey. When hot, it's thinner than water. 
Mobile One adapts and readapts to last longer. 16,000 kilometers between oil changes. That's your engine evolved. Saul Gann is the authorized distributor of mobile lubricants. At Sash Financial, we create strategies for strengthening business and personal finances while helping our clients to build sustainable wealth. Our financial and business consultancy services are uniquely tailored to ensure every client receives quality packages and optimal results. Our financial services include financial reporting and analysis, financial status assessment, internal audits, bookkeeping and records management, financial planning advice, tax returns. Our business advisory services are related to business plans, business startups, operational improvement, business management, document preparation, procedures development, efficient marketing. Call or WhatsApp us today for your free consultation on telephone number 592-665-6045. Sash Financial, strengthening businesses, building wealth. of men standing strong but never too proud to stoop and help someone we must send a clear signal to all do right walk in upright ways knowing that's what being a man is all about and ever aware that things will only get worse when good men do nothing stand strong be the one to live right Mom, what are you doing with GPL on your list? Child, you forgot I have to pay GPL? You got time with GPL. I have to keep these lights on. The customers who think in that manner and refuse to honor their obligation to GPL are obviously not playing their part in ensuring quality service delivery. So, I will continue to pay my GPL bill on time, every time. I recognize the value of your point, Mom. You were right. Welcome back. Faced with a delay in the supply of the second dose of the Sputnik coronavirus vaccine, the health minister, Dr. Frank Anthony, today announced that the government will continue to administer the first dose as it awaits the arrival of the second dose. The health minister said second doses of the Russian-made vaccine are expected in Guyana next week. He explained that the Sputnik vaccines are two different vaccines for the two doses. He said the time between the first dose and the second dose is 4 to 12 weeks, and therefore those persons missing their second shots right now can still get vaccinated when the second dose arrives next week. That you can extend that interval from 4 weeks to up to 12 weeks. So anytime between 4 to 12 weeks, you can get that second dose. So while we are delayed, every, everyone who would have received their first dose, Sputnik, would get their second dose. It wouldn't happen perhaps on the, the fourth, fourth week interval, but certainly you will get it a little bit after because of this delay in supply that we've experienced. Okay. And um, once, once we get those supplies in, we are hoping that by next week we'll be able to get those supplies in, uh, we'll start rolling out those second doses. The health ministry was forced to make a statement on the vaccine shortage last evening as hundreds of persons who got the first shot turned up at health centers for their second shot and got turned away. The health minister said with regards to the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is also being administered in Guyana, the first and second doses are the same. He said there are second doses of that vaccine available for those who have already gotten their first dose. However, there are no first doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. The situation with China's Sinopharm vaccine is the same. 
AstraZeneca, the same vaccine that you get for your first dose, is the same vaccine that you'll get for your second dose. So what we did, the amount of AstraZeneca that we, that we got in the country, we took half of it and we set it aside for person's second dose. And then we used the other half to give out as first dose. Most of that we have given to people and because you have that time interval between 8 to 12 weeks, um, we have kept back your second dose. So those persons who are becoming due now for their second dose AstraZeneca can come to any one of our health centers or vaccination sites that we are giving the, where we are giving the vaccines and you'll be able to get your AstraZeneca second dose. What we are not doing right now is to take in new persons to give them AstraZeneca first dose. So at the various vaccination site, if you've had an AstraZeneca first dose and you're due for your second dose, you can come and we'll be able to give you that second dose. Meanwhile, over 190,000 persons have already taken their first shot of one of the three vaccines and more than 60,000 persons have received both doses. Uh, so far, we have 194,749 persons who would have received their first dose. This approximates to about 40% of our adult population. And uh, in terms of second dose, uh, we've had, um, as of yesterday, 65,534 persons receiving their second dose. This approximates to 13.5% of our adult population. So I think we are um, constantly improving. We are increasing those numbers. And with every day, as we increase those numbers, we are taking a step closer to getting to herd immunity. With its plan to get herd immunity by getting more persons vaccinated, the Ministry of Health and the government are looking to procure additional vaccines tonight. Blaming a high salary bill and low productivity, the state-owned Ghana Water Incorporated has started moves to reduce its workforce by more than 300 persons. At a press conference, GWI Chief Executive Officer Sheikh Baksh said the decision is part of the company's plan to rationalize its workforce. Mr. Baksh said the number of GWI staff has increased by more than 400 under the last government between 2015 and 2020. He said with a salary bill also increasing by more than 150%, the company cannot continue on with such high staffing and salary numbers. Financial operations of GWI, we have to look at the expenses, not only um, employment costs, but we're looking at energy costs, we're looking at other areas of operations, chemical usage, and all of these things. And therefore, um, we had to proceed on this and we reached a, a, a stage where um, a number of employees will have to be terminated in accordance with the, the law, that is the Termination of Employment and Severance Pay Act. We operate within a legal framework and after consultation. Back said the decision to terminate the more than 300 employees from several departments was also based on recommendations from a review that was done on the company's operations and financial position. We found that the employment numbers moved from about just over 600 in 2015 to over 1300 in 2020. And the cost, employment cost, moved from about 96 million in 2015 to 240 million in August, at August 2020, a staggering 140% increase. And we recognized that this was not sustainable at GWI, and therefore the um, staffing establishment rationalization. GWI Human Resources Director Elvis Jordan said a number of meetings have already been held to properly brief employees on the situation at the water company. We had had several meetings um, with staff early in the year, bringing them to understand uh, the, the position of the company and what is the, the way forward with the company. 
Officials of GWI have indicated that last year the company found itself on the verge of a possible financial collapse, with more than $1 billion in losses. The CEO said the company was forced to turn to a bank overdraft to pay employees their salaries. He also said the situation has since changed, and the company is now operating with a surplus. Well, PNC reform leader and former president David Granger today said he is convinced that the move to file charges against retired assistant commissioners Paul Slow and Clinton Conway and the other former senior officers is nothing more than an attempt by the government to derail the Police Service Commission. During his public interest television program, Mr. Granger said Mr. Slow and the other retired senior officers who have been charged over fraud allegations served the Yana police force and the country with distinction during their time in the force, and he has no reason to question their integrity. It seems that the people who brought about these charges are on a fishing expedition. They have no evidence. They, they, they are just seeking to besmirch the reputation of these persons who themselves are former police officers who have served with distinction. The PNC leader said while charging the officials may satisfy the agenda of a few, it could have a severe impact on the wider Guyanese society, since citizens would not have confidence in the police force. Once you start to tinker and tamper with the police service commission, trust, trust, public trust, <laughs> public trust is going to drain away. People will say to themselves, you know, what really is happening um, when the chairman of the Police Service Commission, an honorable position, um, when the chairman is being uh, treated in this way. Mr. Granger also said the functions of the Police Service Commission, as outlined in the Constitution, are critical. And toying with such an institution could damage the fabric of not only the Commission, but the police force also. Once you start attacking the commissions, um, you are undermining trust, the confidence which the public has in the ability of these organizations to, to exercise oversight and to regulate the, um, the forces or the organizations of which they have that oversight. Again, you're looking at some hidden agenda, you're looking at the deep state, you're looking at people who do not want to see um, efficient regulatory uh, uh, agencies and institutions in place. The retired assistant commissioners and some other senior officers along with some current senior officers were charged for allegedly conspiring with each other and persons unknown to defraud the Ghana police force of $10 million. The team of retired officers were tasked with updating the force's standing orders and the $10 million referred to in the fraud charges represent the money that they were paid for the several months of their service. Let's tell you now that as CARICOM seeks to encourage member states to cut back on food importation across the region and become more self-sufficient, President Irfan Ali, who holds responsibility in CARICOM for agriculture, said there needs to be political will and financing, and the removal of non-tariff restrictions to ensure the region's food situation is more secured. Speaking this morning at the CARICOM Regional Dialogue on Food Systems, the President insisted that there remains a need for greater intervention to ensure food security within CARICOM. The Caribbean must aim at becoming more, more food secure. This exercise must be sustained and must involve increased production of foods consumed within the region. But it must also entail increased extra-regional trade in agricultural commodities. The dismantling of barriers to the trade in agricultural commodities will enhance regional food security. If the region is to become more food secure, it has to begin to source more of its food needs from within the Caribbean, and this will require the removal of unnecessary non-tariff barriers to intra-regional trade. President Ali said the Caribbean region can also have sustainable food security once the immediate problems facing the region are addressed. The solution exists. What is required is the political will and the financing to give effect to what needs to be done to develop the region's food systems. I believe that the time has come and the time is ripe for us to do so. The Caribbean region faces many challenges in developing a competitive agri-food system. 
that can contribute to the achievement of its food security and economic goals. And with the advent of climate change also, there is concern that some vulnerable countries in the region could see their agriculture sector being threatened. But financing for regional agriculture cannot be divorced from financing for climate resilience. Environmental threats impact on the region's food systems. Financing for mitigation and adaptation to climate change is more critical today than ever before and is necessary to protect the region's food systems. The success of our efforts in doing so depend on the degree of international support received, especially in respect to financing for building an agricultural sector that is more resilient. In the past years, the Caribbean region has averaged an import bill of over 4 billion US dollars for food and goods. With the advent of COVID-19, countries in the region continue to struggle with rising food prices due to their dependence. Four men who were allegedly nabbed with two illegal guns on Independence Day during two separate police operations have been charged with possession of an illegal firearm and granted bail in the sum of $200,000 each. The four accused, Antonio Fraser, Keith Gaines, Taj Fraser and Brandon Barker, all appeared before Magistrate Shuttle Isaacs and denied the allegations made against them. It is alleged that on the 26th of May at Main Street, Georgetown, Taj Fraser had a 9mm pistol along with matching rounds in his possession. The three other men, Brandon Barker, Antonio Fraser and Keith Keynes, were arrested on the same day. After the police said they found a .32 Taurus pistol with two live matching rounds in a car that they were in. They were nabbed along Brick Dam. The arrests were made based on information that was provided to the police. The four men will return to court in a new month for the continuation of the case. My name is Dr. Karen Cummings, a public health specialist and former minister within the Ministry of Public Health. I have taken my Sputnik V vaccine today. It was a very simple process. I encourage you to come and take your vaccine very soon so that we can contain this virus and have herd immunity in Guyana. Super 95 gasoline gives you more reasons to drive and is available at 56 service stations nationwide. For affordable price, high performance and high mileage, choose Guyol's Super 95 gasoline. Hi Guyana, this is Amanzo Waltz and they say you're a member of parliament and I'm here to encourage each and every one of you to take the COVID-19 vaccine. I have taken my vaccine, and now I know that there are a lot of reservations, and I encourage each and every one of us to research, understand the facts. For me, what I understand is that while taking the vaccine will not um, prevent me from contracting COVID, if I do contract COVID, it lessens the possibility of me dying, and it lessens the possibility of me suffering long-term effects and complications. And so I want to encourage each and every one of us to get vaccinated today. The sooner we get vaccinated, the sooner we can go outside.
Across the region tonight, authorities in Trinidad and Tobago are probing the discovery of 13 decomposed bodies in a foreign boat off the coast of Tobago. The Trinidad and Tobago Emergency Response Agency said the decomposed bodies were removed and taken to a morgue. They were all in an advanced stage of decomposition and all appeared to be men of African descent. They were clad in track suits and rain jackets. It is suspected that the group might have been migrants from Africa who were hoping to reach Brazil. There have been at least three previous cases of dead bodies in boats being discovered in the Caribbean over the past year alone. A Dominican court has restrained the authorities in Dominica from removing fugitive jeweler Mihul Chosky from the country, throwing up yet another hurdle to India's attempts to have him brought home and tried in India's largest bank fraud case. Choksi, who was born in India, was captured in Dominica earlier this week after going missing from the Caribbean nation of Antigua on Sunday, triggering a global manhunt. He had been living in Antigua where he had secured a passport after fleeing India before the fraud came to light. He is one of the main defendants in the case. After Choksi was detained, Antigua refused to take him back, and the Prime Minister Gaston Brown told the Reuters news agency that the country was in talks with Dominica as well as the Indian government for his repatriation to India. The court order blocking his repatriation came after Choksi filed a habeas corpus petition, which determines whether a detention is lawful against Dominican authorities. And finally tonight, international news. Russian President Vladimir Putin has dismissed Western outrage over the diversion of a Ryanair jet to the Belarus capital from where a dissident and his girlfriend were seized. During talks in the Russian resort city of Sochi, Mr. Putin and his Belarusian counterpart Alexander Lukashenko spoke of an outpouring of emotion. The EU has since urged Europe-based airlines to avoid Belarusian airspace. They have demanded the release of the journalist and his girlfriend. The pair had been flying from Athens in Greece to Vilnius to EU capitals last Sunday when a fighter jet was scrambled over Belarus to escort their plane to land at the Minsk airport over a bomb threat, which turned out to be fake. And that's your news source evening bulletin for tonight and this week. I'm Gordon Mosley reporting and encouraging you to stay safe.